Good morning. Welcome to Dunwoody and this month's leadership lecture series. And the Dunwoody Alumni Association is who started this lecture series. And so I'm going to ask Paul Berman, a 1982 Dunwoody graduate and part of our Dunwoody Alumni Association, to introduce our speaker today. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. What an awesome day, isn't it? Beautiful. I say that because you wake up to a day like this, and it's 73 some odd degrees. And to put that in perspective, it's not 20 below zero yet. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, uh, welcome to the C. Charles Jackson Leadership Series program. It's my pleasure to introduce Sheila Payroll. Sheila joined Donaldson Company in 1978, where she held a variety of positions in corporate technology, engine filtration, industrial filtration, before becoming general manager of Donaldson Aerospace and Defense Business in 2004. She was promoted to Vice President and Chief Technology Officer in 2012. Her role as CTO, Chief Technology Officer, she, held, she managed the global research and development function, including laboratory management, air filtration, mist filtration, media development, process technology development, modeling, simulation, and CAE tool development, advanced technology. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of New Mexico and has an MBA from the University of St. Thomas. She also holds a patent for the development of plate lock, a processing procedure used to manufacture air filters. Please join me in welcoming Sheila Payroll. Well, how is everybody out there today? I really do appreciate the opportunity to talk and I I'm going to start here with uh, the title of my presentation, which is my story. So that doesn't sound very compelling. But I decided to kind of use my story as a framework for maybe part cautionary tale, because I'm of an age where I've made a lot of mistakes, and I can talk a bit to that. Part platform for giving advice, because who doesn't want to listen to advice from a total stranger? And partly because I really want you to do the same thing for yourselves if you haven't done it already. So in speaking, I'm going to talk a little bit about who I am. You, you know my name and what I do. But I think throughout the course of this presentation, you'll get a better sense of what I think and what I believe. Um, how I got here, I don't go through a whole lot of path on career, but certainly uh, evolution of who I am and how, what, I, uh, you know, what I've gone through to get here. A lot about what I believe, and then I'm going to kind of right off the bat talk about key messages, because if I do a good job today, I'm going to leave you with um, I'm going to leave you with an, uh, a, a really strong idea that I, I think you need to become a student of yourself. And that means going back and really looking at your family of origin and saying, okay, you know, where, where did I get these beliefs? What have I held close to me that is impacting my leadership of myself or of others as I go through life? I also really want you to be thinking about your own self-talk. And what I mean is that whole inner dialogue that everybody goes through with themselves. You know, how much of that is good, how much of that is bad, how much of it serves you and doesn't serve you, what are you going to do about that? But you, you can't do anything about it if you don't start to listen to it. And I also really want to encourage you to be a goal a goal writer. There's some magic in being able to really think through what do you want to do and then being able to put that down in writing. There, I, I think every time I've actually put something down in writing and reviewed it, it, it actually has come true. I don't, I don't pretend to understand why that's the case, but all of a sudden your behaviors and decisions seem to align toward that. 
And then finally, be a student of your own reality, because I think my hardest lesson is there is no one reality. You get to make your own. So as long as you have that choice, why not? Why not create a reality that makes sense? And there's times where you have to reframe that because the reality you created, again, is not serving you. And then I encourage everybody to remember to use their power. We all have power inside of us. And I'm not telling you anything new with any of these things. All of you guys know this. I'm just up here as some guilty conscience reminding you of these things. Okay, so any, any discussion of me has to start with my family of origin. So starting with my parents, uh, they, were, they were complete opposites, and I think that's probably why you're given two parents. So on the one hand, my father grew up as this kind of tough Irish kid from the Bronx, and he managed to, on a combination of work and scholarships, make it through Fordham Prep and Manhattan College, and then during World War II, he was a naval officer. And then after World War II, he went on, on the GI Bill and got a degree in law. So he was a pick yourself up by your bootstraps type of guy. He believed in personal responsibility and that he, you had to create your own future. So if I think about what I remember him saying to me the most often was shake it off. And that meant don't be a victim, get up, you know, carry on, deal with it. My mother, on the other hand, was from a fairly wealthy family, and she was very empathetic, smart, had a real disregard for authority, and the thing I remember her saying most often is where one door closes, another one opens. She kind of believed if you were open, the universe would provide. So these guys were really opposite in their view of life, However, their values around family, around education, around self-sufficiency and independence were very well aligned. And I think from a family standpoint, that's where those values came from. So I, I challenge all of you to really think through what those family messages were that are impacting you today. So on the right-hand side, I'm, I'm the kid on the left there. We were. Uh, six kids, all born within nine years, and it was really a madhouse. Um, I think that experience left me with uh, a real struggle to fit in and probably a lot of empathy because you always had to consider your own needs in the context of seven other people, but also a very high need to be liked. So. You know, as I have gone through management and managing people, I think that's a huge part. I love the empathy part of it. I love the radar I have about other people's moods and interpersonal uh, aspects. But the high need to be liked has often gotten, it's not that it gets in my way, because my sense of responsibility usually takes over, but it makes it very painful when I have to do something like lay people off. Okay, so I'm challenging all of you to kind of tell your own story, write it down. But I think um, then kind of going on, after, right after college, I got married to my husband, Rob. So I always knew I wanted to work, but I never really viewed myself as a primary breadwinner. So I had all this expectation on my husband, and he always gravitated more to a... Uh, a job that was commission-based, and I never felt like we could really depend on it. And so here I was with all this expectation on him, and then when our children were born, I think it exacerbated it. You know, all of a sudden, I, I was realizing, okay, if I have all this expectation on him, um, I could ruin our relationship, because that's just not the way this is going to go down. So at that point in time, I got much more serious about my career. I, I started looking at it on a long-term basis. What am I going to do? I'm going to be working for my whole life, and how, how am I going to handle that? So at that point, I got more serious about goal setting. I decided to go back to get my MBA. And by the time I actually went back, I had two kids. 
And uh, this is what that stage of life kind of felt like. So running like mad from task to task. But in a way it was better because now I took that power and I was doing something with it. I wasn't just sitting there pointing to somebody else to do it. And actually the kind of addendum to this is my husband at age 48, you know, ended up starting a business and just really kicking my behind on the, you know, the ability to make a living. So I think taking that pressure off of him changed things for him as well. But at any rate, it was nuts, just running from thing to thing. Um, and I think that's when I realized, okay, I got to start some goal setting here again because I, uh, my life is kind of out of whack. So this is what I put together for myself. But again, I, I challenge you to think about what would you put in terms of goals? Where would you put them? I have them on family, <clears throat> career, health, and spirituality. So you can see I made different size boxes there, and that kind of had to do with how much attention I paid to those goals. And if I talked about the time I spent in those aspects of my life, it would kind of tip way toward the career part. Uh, and I'm not proud of that. That's just the way things went down at that particular time. But sometimes you're not able to, to be very specific about your career goals, but put down what you can put down. Write it down, and then just keep repeating it. So for family, it might have even been stuff like, how much time was I going to spend with the kids doing what, and what was the quality of that time? Spirituality is different for all of us, but for me it was quiet, meditative time to really think about things beyond all of the minutia of what I was going through. Um, Health is one I probably really had to learn the hard way because I was uh, often, I, you know, over-caffeinated and didn't sleep enough and I took that one for granted. So I was always a runner, but at a certain point in time I ended up with a seizure disorder. So they did a whole bunch of tests. They could never find anything organic there, but it really was the two things that brought it on consistently were lack of sleep and stress. So again, you, you've got to figure out these dimensions of life and what you're going to do. So what would you put in those boxes? Would you have you know, educational goals? Would you have something uh, more artistic? You know, what, what different dimensions would you put there? Okay, so the philosoph my philosophy of life, these are things that I hold to be true. The first one being that the only power we have is how we interpret what goes down in our lives. So you can't control what happens. You can only control your reaction to how it happens. And on a good day, there is no good and bad. There is only what I learned from it. You know, on a bad day, I can be a victim. I'm kind of sounding like Mother Teresa up here. That is not at all where I am. I constantly have to learn it. But because I wrote it down, I recognize it a little faster. And I do believe one gains from an experience in direct proportion to how much you invest in it. So those of you in school, you can tell the difference of when you've prepared to sit, you know, read the material before you sit in a class versus kind of coming in unprepared. It's much more boring when you didn't invest that. Okay, so then this idea of reality. There is no one reality. Everybody gets to create their own. And there's probably a million examples I can use of that, but I can think of this one time where I gave a woman that I work with um, some, I'll call it constructive feedback, though she didn't really consider it to be that. She stopped talking to me for weeks, and you know, I'm kind of subliminally realizing, all right, this is not good. So I had to finally go to her and say, all right, if I promise to just shut up, will you tell me what you're feeling or why you're mad. And I, of course, wanted to grind off my molars at that point because she's going to yell at me. 
but it doesn't matter. That was her reality. I had to just shut up and listen to it because that was her reality. It wasn't mine, but mine didn't matter in that case. I could have, you know, all day long disagreed with her, and then we'd be right back where we started. So in managing people or leading people, I think that's a huge one. And then, of course, my happiness is my responsibility. I think uh, Lincoln said, you're as happy as you make up your mind to be. And I really do believe that. Anytime I start to put my happiness in somebody else's hands, it's a bad thing. Then I'm full of expectations, and I, I put my power in somebody else's hands instead of my own. OK, and goal setting, I can't say this enough. Your thoughts create reality. And again, this is not new to any of you. But you can't even make it a reality if, you can't, if it can't exist as a thought in your mind to begin with. So that's always the case. You, you name any invention that's ever been invented, it started as a thought in somebody's mind. And as soon as they thought it could be real, then it takes a path of its own. But if you, if you never can even articulate that, it's never going to become reality. And then stress is internally generated. So all of us have seen, like, maybe even a job as a waitress, or a job as a taxi driver, it, or a job as an executive. It doesn't matter. Some, you, you view those people, and you can see sometimes they're under terrific stress. And it, it's, it's their own self-talk that is getting them there. It's not the external environment that is getting them there. OK, and this whole self-talk thing, listen to yourselves. Sometimes you need to write that down even so that you can objectively see, God, am I really thinking this? But that self-talk is what is going to impact all your beliefs about your environment. It's going to impact your self-confidence, and it's going to impact your stress. So really, be a student of yourself. <clears throat> so in terms of my career path, it's not going to be the same as a lot of yours, because I stayed in the same company for 38 years. So that's kind of an artifact of history, and I, I wouldn't expect it to be the case for most people. So I started as a lab technician and little by little kind of went up the path. But there was a lot of stress, even if, if, if I was in the same company, just believing that I could make that next path was a very difficult thing. But one of the, one of the things that was probably most important was just making sure you went through role changes, because that's really where you learn the most about yourself. And the main thing you learn is that you can get through it. Because some of those role changes, you're incompetent. You, you got into this next job, you're incompetent. And to just kind of accept that in yourself and say, no, I did this last time, and I know that I can learn my way through it is a huge deal. And there's been lots of experiences in there, like in one case, I was put into a role on purpose as a change agent. So me, I told you that you know I have a high need to be liked, and I'm put in this situation where I'm telling everybody that, no, what you're doing is wrong, and just trying to figure out, OK, how do I do that? How do I do that without creating resistance and resentment and insulting the people that were responsible for that status quo? So, I mean, some of these things are, are a tricky business, and you just kind of have to get to the point where people realize you're sincerely trying to change things for the best. Um, okay, fear of failure is a big one for me, and I think for some reason, maybe women are more open about it, but I, I tend to see that more common in women, just that fear of, you know, they won't go forward and, and volunteer for the job. Oftentimes, they have to be tapped. And so that is kind of a, a difficult one. But you just have, you have to watch yourself talk and have to talk yourself into it. Uh, I have this challenging job, Widowmaker. And the last job I took, which is the CTO role, um, uh, that was very difficult for me. I mean, the, the amount of stress I felt after I got in there was very intense. And mainly because 
I couldn't look back through history, my 38 years of history, and say, so-and-so did this job right. They, it was, they might have done a decent job, but that group was always picked on and always uh, kind of disrespected. So me, with my high need to be liked in a job that everybody kind of really made fun of, was a very difficult situation. I, I think I have somebody in my group here, actually, so you, you can ask him whether, whether there, there's yet to be a successful person in this role. Okay, so another bullet point I want to talk about here is going negative. I, I don't know why I do it. I still do it. I, uh, I think it comes from not feeling good about myself, but there'll be times where all of a sudden I'm negative about my job, I'm negative about my boss, it, it's just a, a terrible thing, but because I have it down on paper, I recognize it faster and I can get myself out of it faster. So again, look at why are you, you know, what, why are you going negative, are you going negative, what are you going to do to get out of that situation? For me, I think if I could just do something good for somebody else, it pulls me back out of it, or it starts to pull me back out of it. But it has to do with, I think the next one I put here, it really has to do with that I put my power outside of myself. I let somebody else define me. I decided this boss doesn't think I'm good, and then before you know it, I'm in some sort of a ridiculous mindset about it. But all of that has to do with putting your power outside yourself. Don't do that. You guys are the ones that get to define who you are and whether you're good at something. Don't go letting someone else tell you that. And then health, we kind of talked about, but you know, make sure that you have a life that's balanced around a bunch of different parameters. There's a whole bunch of arenas to be successful in life, so don't make one all lopsided versus the other. And so, uh, it, it, for me, that whole stress thing is, you know, making sure I, I actually have a horse, and that is kind of my, I tell my husband it's cheaper than a psychologist, and he assures me that it's not. <laughs> and then that is not me running. I wish it was, but again, you have to think positive, right? <laughs> or time in nature, or whatever that is for you guys. So. Think to yourself, what is that? What is your quiet time, your time to get out and de-stress? But make a commitment to it. Especially when you're in school and things revolve around crazy time frames where the stress gets huge at the end of it. You gotta pay attention to that. So my management philosophy, I really do believe people wanna do their best. So I start with that premise. Now, there are exceptions to that. There are people that are, could, could be poison to your group, but I have to deal with those exceptions very quickly. Because within a short period of time, I know their wife and their kids and what they're thinking, and if, if I let that go on too long, I will still do it out of a sense of responsibility, but it'll kill me even more. <coughs> So it, it might sound easy, but for me it is actually easy. Creating an environment where everybody has a stake in it, everybody has ownership in it. And I, it's taken me a long time to not feel insecure about it, but there are people in my group that are so much smarter than me, so much better than me at certain areas of it. Just roll with it, you know? It, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you'll be more successful. And then I am collaborative, because if you have all these smart people, why are you telling them what to do? They should be telling you what to do, so it, it has to be that interplay. And I, I, again, I might sound like Mother Tracy here. There's like Paul sitting out in the audience, and there has been times where you know, I'm flying off with the Effenheimer at the group and all sorts of things, but they trust me enough. I think at this point, to tell me you're out of line, <laughs> and they know I'll listen to them. And then building a team is paramount. Again, in this role that I'm in right now, I, that was the hardest assignment I've ever had. And I, in, I've had a million different groups, and it's not been that difficult. This group had an underlying competition going on in the group, and 
it took me a lot of thinking about how do we get over that. I'm not quite sure we're completely over it, but you have to really study the dynamics of your group and be honest with them about what you see and what's getting in your way because there is nothing like a well-humming group that really trusts each other and are lined up. You, you can do the impossible, but with a group that's dysfunctional, it's, it's really hard. Okay, I think, okay, so I'm gonna end, if it is, again, if I did a good job, this is what I hope you took out of this. I, I really ask that you be a student of yourself, that you go back and think about your family of origin and what they've given you in terms of beliefs and values. Listen to your self-talk. If it doesn't serve you, change it. You can really change it. And spend time articulating your goals and writing them down because it's magic. And then there are times where you're gonna, your reality, as much as you think it's real, you do have the ability to kind of reframe it and say, okay, from this other perspective, that this is maybe what happened. And then keep that power inside of yourself and use that power to your advantage. <laughs>